Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our first LGBTQIA plus in STEM event. Uh, I'm Nico Hayesier, and I'm an administrative assistant in the science and math division, as well as a member of the LGBTQIA plus equity team. Um, so this speaker series is a collaboration between Massasoit STEM and the LGBTQIA plus equity team, highlighting out queer and trans professionals in STEM careers. Thank you to our faculty and staff, as well as STEM scholars, Gender Sexuality Alliance, and anyone else joining us today. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Lauren Esposito, brachnologist and creator of 500 Queer Scientists. Without further ado, I will turn the meeting over to Lauren, and we will allow time at the end for Q&A. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nico, um, for the invitation to, to talk to you all today, and, and for those of you that are here. Thanks for showing up to, to listen to me. Um, so I thought what I would do today, if it sounds good to everyone, uh, is just share a bit about my personal journey uh, in STEM, how I got to where I am, and, and, and what led me to, to start 500 Queer Scientists and what that even means, uh, or at least what I think it means. Um, so uh, I guess like starting out just to, to tell you a little bit about where I am and where I'm sitting right, right now. Um, I'm speaking to you from this, what's called now today, the city of San Francisco. Um, and for those of you who, who have been to San Francisco, perhaps you had an opportunity to visit the California Academy of Sciences. Um, even if you didn't, you may remember in that visit, had you made one, that California is a really hilly place. Uh, that's if, no matter where you go, you're either walking up or downhill. Um, and I work in a museum that's that's actually been modeled uh, around the, the hills of San Francisco. It's a public science museum, which means that we have a public floor that's open to uh, over over two million visitors every year walking through the doors. Um, and it's it's this really beautiful place. It's like this architectural marvel, I guess you could you could call it um, that that's modeled after the seven hills of San Francisco. And it's really intended to be this this building that's raised up out of the Golden Gate Park. Um, which is where it's situated, and and then a, a building just sort of slotted underneath. And, and so I get to come here to work every single day, which is feels really lucky. Um, it's it's the oldest institution, it's the oldest scientific institution um, west of the Mississippi. It was founded as of yesterday, uh, 169 years ago. And the thing that I really admire about the Cal Academy, and and I think that. It, it really kind of speaks to, the, to what was happening in the Western United States at the time, um, is that the Cal Academy was founded and it's in, in its original charter and it explicitly included women, which was something really unusual um, for that era. Um, and in the 169 years that the Cal Academy has existed, it's, it's really been a pioneer in many ways for gender equity in STEM. The first curator that we ever hired, that we ever employed, was a woman. Uh, and I think that that really speaks to the institution's willingness to take risks and invite diversity in many ways into their um, academy. But in that same 169 years, I came to learn after I was hired that I'm the first openly queer curator in its history. And, and that's, that's, I think there's a couple of odd things about that. The first is that San Francisco is the most gay friendly city in America. Uh, it's been, it's long been a place where, where LGBTQ identifying folks came as a respite from the rest of the country where they were so often misunderstood. They formed a community here, they gained rights here, often, oftentimes well before uh, the rights that were being given by the rest of the country um, within the municipality. And so, so in many ways, it's an inviting place for queer folks. So, so then I, I think where I'm left wondering is why then in the 169 year institution of a history of a really progressive institution in one of the most progressive cities in the United States, particularly where it concerns queer folks, am I the first one? And I think um, what I would like to, to, to go on a journey through today in this talk is sort of why I think that is and, and what, what I believe is, is the, the root of why we have had a history of, of visibility for queer folks in STEM um, that falls behind the visibility of queer folks in many other disciplines um, and fields of study. So, so um, 
anyways, here's here's where I am, and, and just to give you a sense of of what what it looks like inside, this is it's really this really this beautiful natural history museum. We also have an aquarium. We have this living rainforest dome. Um, we have a planetarium. We have like sort of traditional dioramas like you'd expect to see in a natural history museum. But what drew me here was not any of that, although all of that is really fantastic and it's great to be able to have that kind of access to the general public as a scientist. Uh, but what brought me here is actually this, it's the collections. And, and collections, when you talk about museums in particular science museums, collections are, are typically what we talk about is making up uh, what a science museum even is in the first place. And uh, I came here as the curator uh, of arachnology. And what that means is that I'm responsible for conducting primary research on the biodiversity of life. And the way that I do that is primarily by working in this library of life that we hold in our institution. We have um, over 46 million natural history objects in our institution. Um, and the ones that I'm most concerned with are, are ones that look like this, scorpions and spiders and, and things like that. Um, things that fall under the realm of arachnology, which means typically they have eight legs and two primary body parts. Um, but my main line of research is actually this. I study scorpions. Uh, that's what I, I've been working on since I started my graduate studies. Um, and I continue to work on scorpions. Uh, I, I find them absolutely fascinating. Although if, I, if, I, if you were to ask me when I was a child whether I have always loved arachnids and scorpions, the answer is a resounding no. Um, I was interested in, in sort of like creepy crawlies, I guess you could call them as a kid, but, but I wasn't interested in scorpions. And it wasn't until I was an undergraduate um, at the University of Texas at El Pasto taking entomology class and doing an internship and with, with the scorpion biologist that I really came to realize that for me as a young student really interested in how life forms on earth, the study of evolution, um, how life exists on earth or the study of ecology, that scorpions are a fantastic model system. They've been on earth for over 450 million years. And in this time, very little about their basic architecture has changed. Um, they still exist in essentially the same way as their ancestors that were around before even the first ferns or the dinosaurs. Um, but in that time, they've continually, they've continued to thrive, to diversify, to speciate and to survive in a changing earth. And so I think for, for me really trying to understand at the heart of how life on earth forms and continues to evolve and secondarily, how life on earth is going to face the changes that are occurring in increasingly rapid scale through global change, scorpions are a great model to do that. And, and so that's still the, the main uh, organism that I use as a model for my studies. And I think oftentimes when people think about scorpions, what they think about is a setting like this, this is the Arizona desert. And like, if you've ever watched any kind of like old Western movie that takes place in the desert, there's always this inevitable moment where you hear that like kind of whistling music in the, back, in the background and there's like a, a shot of a scorpion crawling across a dusty road right before the like big shootout or whatever is about to happen. Um, and, and so I think people have this, this idea, this mindset that, that scorpions exist um, in deserts, which they absolutely do. Uh, but the real diversity of scorpions exists outside of deserts in many cases. Um, and what, where I study in particular uh, is on tropical islands all over the world. So I go places like this. This is a um, a tropical island off the coast of central West Africa called Sao Tome, uh, or places like this. This is a, an island uh, off the coast of peninsular Malaysia called Penang, uh, where I went to gather data to petition for a UNESCO biosphere uh, recognition. Or places like this. This is the Choco Rainforest. It's the wettest place on earth and absolutely an incredible place to, to go and study. But this is also not where I grew up. I grew up uh, so in, a, in a setting similar to that first picture, the desert. Um, I grew up in a city called El Paso, Texas, which is on the southern uh, border of the United States at the, at the border of Mexico. Um, and, and it was an amazing place to grow up. We were surrounded by natural areas. Uh, you could drive in four hours in any direction and you would never encounter another major city. Um, and so for me growing up there, I spent a lot of time in nature. Um, and I think that that's really where I developed my, my love of nature. I think in many ways, um, nature felt more accepting than peers and community as like a young queer person who didn't completely understand their identity. 
Um, I also grew up in a really Hispanic community. Uh, El Paso is because of the nature of its setting um, is in an almost entirely Hispanic community. We have a sister city on the other side of the border, Ciudad Juarez, which is um, uh, about 2 million people. And on the US side, it's about a million. So altogether, um, this bi-national metropolis is about 3 million people. And it's pretty progressive uh, as such a big city, you'd expect it to be progressive. But, but I think the, the, the thing about growing up in Hispanic culture, and it's a culture that I love for so many reasons. It's my culture. Uh, I love the food. I love the parties. I love the co sense of community that it, that it holds. But what I don't love is the sense of guilt that's associated with being queer. Um, and that sense of guilt is a legacy from colonialism. It's a legacy from Catholicism. And whether your family is a practicing Catholic or not, um, oftentimes what happens, I think, in Hispanic cultures is that the feeling of not being able to talk or be openly queer that exists within the Catholic Church is carried over into the broader community um, of non-practicing folks um, or progressive folks. And that feeling, I think, as a young person growing up was really uh, toxic. It was, it was sort of choking. Uh, to exist within as a young queer person. Um, and, and so I think it drove me in many ways to associate more with playing with nature in my backyard than with playing with peers. Um, not to say that I was like an antisocial kid in any way, at least I don't, I don't think, but nobody's ever told me otherwise. Um, but, I, but I think like I just loved observing the nature around me and I grew up spending a lot of time in the backyard flipping over all the pavers in the garden or the pots to look for like earwigs and cockroaches and things like that that were living underneath them. Um, and I think that it was then that I probably found my first scorpion. There was definitely scorpions around. I remember they lived in like a little sewer grate by my house uh, and my friends and I would dare each other to go look inside the sewer grate because we knew there were scorpions in there. Um, but I didn't think about scorpions for a long time. I, I grew up obviously, I continued into college I actually stayed in El Paso in spite of this sort of claustrophobic uh, feeling of, of community because I wanted to be close to my community and so I didn't leave. Um, and then eventually I grew up, uh, from graduated from undergrad and I went to New York uh, for my master's and PhD where I did um, both at the American Museum of Natural History, which is a, a large natural history museum in New York City. Uh, and that was a really wonderful experience. It was a wonderful experience because first it got me out of my, my sort of closed-minded community for the first time, um, surrounded by a real um, patchwork of cultures, which was really, really exciting for me, and surrounded by a queer community that was out and proud, I think, for the first time in my life. Like I grew up in a place where there wasn't a pride parade, and then I moved to New York City, which has like the oldest pride parade in, well, it was a protest really, the oldest pride protest uh, in the world. And, and that, I think that was a period of time for me to really explore my identity in ways, not that I didn't know what my identity was, but, but in ways that, that I was allowed to do, that it was okay, that it felt okay. And, and the community felt like it was okay to be sort of out and proud. But the one place where I wasn't doing that was in the lab. Uh, so while I was like having this 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 period of my life where I was exploring who I was and being proud about it, I didn't ever bring it to work, and and nobody ever told me that I shouldn't. Um, so so I don't really know where I got that idea from, and for a long time I've struggled to understand where I got the idea that in STEM contexts I shouldn't talk about my queer identity, until I came across this article. Uh, it was a, it was a study done by the American Physical Society published in 2016, and they evaluated the climate for LGBTQ physicists. And what they concluded in this study was that heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM work, that there's a heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM work environments. And I think that this was for the first time a really clear indication that I was feeling things in the lab about hiding, my, needing to hide my identity that many, many other people felt. And so the reality was that even though I felt really alone in these feelings, I wasn't, I wasn't alone in feeling them. Um, we were just told without words, but through culture 
um, that STEM is not a place where you talk about being queer. You don't talk about that aspect of your identity. Um, so I grew up uh, from my PhD and, and it was time for me to graduate. Um, I had to leave New York City, sadly, because that's, that's the nature of academia. Oftentimes we have to move to a new city, to a new institution to continue our careers. And so I started looking for jobs and, and I was looking for postdocs in particular. Um, and at the time in the United States, this was the, 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 the situation in terms of protected classes of employment for LGBTQ folks. Um, so this is a map from, from 2020 actually, so a bit after I was looking for my postdoc. Um, but where, what it shows is, is the places in purple are states where being queer was a protected class of identity for work, for employment. Meaning that in those purple states, you could show up to work, be your boss could find out you were openly queer and you wouldn't get fired. Uh, you couldn't get fired legally. But in all the gray states, um, it was not. Meaning I could get a job, show up to work, my boss or some other university administrator could find out I was queer and I could be fired. And that was legal grounds for termination of my employment. And so when I was living in New York City, sort of realizing the, the rights that I had and the ability that I had to live a queer life um, outside of work, not inside of work yet, I'll, 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 I'll mention, but, but all of a sudden I realized that like the, I, the, the options of where I could get a job were not open to me. Like half the US was not simply not an option for me to look for employment. And for those of you that have been in the job market in academia, or for those of you where that's on the horizon, like oftentimes you're just sort of at the mercy of where somebody's hiring for the thing that you study um, at that given moment in time. It's, it's all very um, serendipitous of, of who's hiring when. And, and so for me, the, the places where I could look for a job were suddenly like decreased significantly. And now I'm really happy to say that, that the Supreme Court ruled in 2020 um, that, that LGBTQ identity should be a protected class of employment. And so this map is no longer relevant, but that doesn't mean that it's comfortable to be out at work. Uh, and I'll just give you an example from, from my own life. Um, so here's a picture of my family. This is a picture from my son's graduation in 2020, pandemic graduation at home. Um, and and it's a, I feel like, you know, it's, it's a kind of picture that like is normal to have on your desk. It's like your family picture, it's a momentous event, everybody looks pretty good. It's the kind of picture that you print out and maybe you get in a frame from your kids for, for your birthday uh, and you put it on your desk at work and you have it to look at. And when people come into your office, they remark about like, what a nice looking family you have. Um, that, I think that's a situation for most uh, people that are cisgender and heterosexual. Um, but for queer folks, that's not what happens. For queer folks, you put a picture of this out on your desk uh, people come into your office. They don't remark about what a nice looking family you have. In fact, what they wanna know is who these people are and how they're connected to you. Um, and what, what happens is that suddenly you're in a situation where you have to decide whether or not you wanna out yourself to this colleague um, and to how much of your life story they're entitled to. Because you know, for me, this is a modern family. This picture is complicated. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that have led up to this being my family. Um, and I don't know that I want to share that with everybody at work, but I want to feel like it's okay for me to have this picture out on my desk. And I think that that fundamentally is what creates or like what has created in STEM culture, this feeling that it's not okay to be out at work. Um, this is this is the end game. Is that I can't put a I feel like I can't put a picture of my family out at work because it would be create an uncomfortable situation for me that was particularly risking professional relationships. So how do we get here? I guess is the question, and it's something that I've been trying to figure out for a long, long time to to understand my own experiences. And so what I want to share with you is some statistics that I've gathered from within the US that have helped me frame my experiences. And, and what, I wanna, what I wanna mention before showing you any of this is that when it comes to queer identities in terms of like how many folks are queer in any country, um, what the experience is like for, the, for 
for people in their education and professional pathways? The answer is we don't know. Most countries, in particular the US, which is where I'm from, don't collect data on LGBTQ identities in the census. We don't collect data in professional scientific societies. We don't collect data through the National Science Foundation Annual Graduate Student Survey, which is our best, uh, our best data for tracking the professional pathways of STEM students and professionals. And so we don't actually have really good ideas or numbers about what happens for queer folks as they move through the education pathways. So many of these are based on self-reported survey data. So people that have come across the survey and decided to answer the questions, um, as well as studies that are done on limited populations of, of students. But here's what we know. We know that transgender folks in the United States have the highest on campus sexual assault and misconduct rates of any student group, which is tough because when you come to university and you're on campus, you expect to be safe. You expect that your safety is paramount to the university and of paramount importance because if you're safe, you're able to focus on your studies. And if you're able to focus on your studies, the probability that you're going to finish them goes up. So if you come onto campus and, and experience actual physical violence, there's a good chance that you're not going to stay on campus and you're not going to move into the out of the STEM undergraduate population and into the STEM pathway. But for all LGBTQ identifying students um, on undergraduate campuses, 60% report incidences of sexual misconduct and harassment while they're undergraduates. So this doesn't mean that it necessarily happened on campus, but what it does mean is that there's this huge burden that they're carrying with them when they walk into the classroom every day that their cisgender heterosexual peers aren't necessarily carrying. They're experiencing violence, they're experiencing harassment um, in or outside of the classroom while they're undergraduates. So how do you focus, right? But I think the thing that's really kind of been disturbing to me, the statistic that's really been disturbing to me ever since I read it, um, was a study that examined the, the probability that undergraduate students who are majoring in STEM will continue to major in STEM through graduation. And what this study found was that for LGBTQ identifying students, they're as likely as cisgender heterosexual students to participate in research, which is great because research experiences are the number one predictor of whether or not you continue in the STEM pathway through undergraduate and into the professional working space or graduate school. But for LGBTQ identifying students, they're 7% less likely to stay in STEM majors, even though they're as likely to ha have experienced research. So they're experiencing research and then they're deciding that they wanna change their major into non-STEM. And I guess the question for me is why is that happening? Like if I, when I, I remember my first research experience, it was amazing. I was like, for the first time, like, oh, I can do this. Like I can be a scientist. And that's actually an option for me professionally. I remember like the curiosity and the wonder that I experienced and, and how incredible it was. And so the idea that that doesn't happen for everybody, I think is troublesome for me. And so to understand what's happening to these students, I think it's really important to look at the broader culture of STEM at the faculty level in universities. And so here's some statistics about that. Um, the first is that 40% of LGBTQ identifying folks in STEM fields are not out to their colleagues. And this sounds kind of like a big number maybe, or maybe it doesn't, um, but it's about equivalent to the national average that we think uh, uh, in terms of people that are, are, are out versus in the closet. Um, so like across the entire country, how many people are, are out? And, and we think that about 40% are not. And so that seems like, okay, like maybe we're, we're doing pretty good, right? But here's what I wanna argue is that when you come to a university and you're employed at a university, the concept of it is that you're, you're free to express your ideas and opinions. You're free to express who you are as an individual and that universities are these like bastions of free ideas, right? Like it's where you come to express freedom of idea. And so how then do you come to a university as a working professional, a creative scientist and feel free to express your ideas but don't feel free to express your personal identity? So you're leaving an entire part of yourself at the door when you walk in. 
And if you look at other, um, other uh, disciplines, other professions um, in universities, for example, sociology um, or psychology, these numbers are not the same. These numbers are significantly lower because in those disciplines, there's a culture that includes personal identity as part of the expression that's happening, but not in STEM. So why would you wanna stay in the closet? Well, the answer is that 69% of people that, that took this survey, which was over 20,000 people, reported that if they were out, they've been made to feel uncomfortable within their own university department as a result of their personal identity. And so that's a good motivation to stay in the closet of coming out your colleagues, your most immediate peers at work that you show up and go to work with every day and like talk to at the water cooler or get coffee with are making you feel uncomfortable on the basis of your queer identity. And 20% of LGBTQ folks report that they, or sorry, LGBTQ folks have reported that they're 20% more likely than their cisgender heterosexual peers to experience professional devaluation as a result of their identity. So not only are they being made to feel uncomfortable, but because of their identity, they're being, their, their contributions to science are, are being uh, diminished, or at least that's their interpretation. And I can say that like all of these things I've also felt. For many years, I wasn't out at work. I mean, I wasn't really hiding anything, but I wasn't certainly wasn't talking about it. Um, I definitely felt exclusion on the basis of my, of my queer identity, and I've definitely felt professional, professionally devalued. I think oftentimes people interpret me as younger or less important, and it does oftentimes feel like it's somehow related to my identity rather than my work. Um, and so all that's definitely problematic for, for staying in STEM, even after getting sort of my dream job, so to speak. And so why is that? Well, this study, this survey of 20,000 people in 2019 concluded that heteronormative assumptions frequently silence conversations about gender and sexuality in STEM workplaces, which to me says that as much as I felt like it wasn't okay to talk about being queer at work, that's the reality. The reality is that it's oftentimes not okay to talk about being queer at work. And, and what's the evidence for that? I think oftentimes, the first response for many cisgender heterosexual folks when you talk about your queer identity is, so what? I don't care about your identity, I care about your science. And while that may be true, it's really important to bring your identity with you to work, to bring your full self, to express your creativity and your personal point of view to, for innovation through STEM. So, those heteronormative assumptions that are silencing these conversations are essentially strangling our creativity and our progress as a STEM workforce. And what this looks like is that we're missing people. Um, there was a, a, an estimate published in a study uh, from last year, I think, that concluded that based on the rates of attrition and the rates of queer folks in, in STEM and in the population in the United States, that there's 121,000 LGBTQ identifying people missing from the current STEM workforce in the US. That's a significant amount of people. Actually, this, peop this, this set of people alone would solve the, the, the labor gap in the California biotech industry uh, for the next seven years. So not only are we missing the creativity, but we're just missing the workforce that needs to get done uh, in order for us to tackle the, the problems that we're facing right now as a, as a global community. And these, these issues have only been compounded by COVID. So uh, a study that was published this year, or maybe last year, 21, 2021 or 2022, I can't recall, found that, that uh, LGBTQ people are 30% more likely to have experienced symptoms of depression within the past year, within the COVID year, um, than their cisgender heterosexual peers in STEM specifically. Um, and that they also experienced greater intentions of leaving their career in the next five years. So that 121,000 predicted people miss currently missing is only predicted to increase as a basis, as a result of the isolation um, and, and stress that has impacted, differentially impacted the queer community due to COVID. Uh, and so all of this is super problematic. And, and I guess it, the thing that, that feels a bit frustrating about it is that, that there are some, some studies that have been done about how to change this. For example, this was a study that was done on uh, looking, examining 
uh, STEM agencies in the US government. So um, people that are working professionally in STEM in the federal government of the United States, where there's really expansive bureaucratized protection for all classes of, of, of um, identity. What they concluded was that despite these expansive non-discrimination policies, bureaucratized accountability structures that formally protect people, that inequalities were still really, really pervasive. And it didn't matter your age cohort. So this isn't like an old generation versus new generation kind of thing. It didn't matter whether you were like high up in your career or, or, or one of the, the people doing the grunt work in the labs. Um, and it didn't matter whether you identified as a woman or a man. And so that, that feels hard. It feels hard to say that like we can put policies in place, but nothing's going to change in terms of the STEM culture. So I think the question is, how do you change the STEM culture? And I don't know the answer. I really don't. I mean, I, I think giving talks like this are important. Getting people to listen to you are important. Um, being there and showing up for people is important. But I don't know what the like silver bullet is for changing the culture in STEM to make it more welcoming for LGBTQ folks. But I know what I did. I, what I did was I decided that I had had enough, I had spent enough years of my life not knowing another queer arachnologist, being the only person in my labs, the only person in my place of employment, the only person in my cohort that identified as queer. And I wanted to know who else was out there because I had all these feelings, all these feelings that I've explained throughout this entire talk, the feelings of isolation, the feelings that you can't bring yourself to work, and I just wanted to meet other people. And so I founded this thing called 500 Crew Sciences. Um, and I founded it as a visibility campaign. I just wanted to tell people that I was here and see if anyone else was out there. Um, I named it 500 Crew Sciences because I really admired the 500 women scientists community, uh, which if you haven't heard about, I encourage you to, to check them out. And the way that they, had created this community and sense of camaraderie among women scientists was something that I aspired to, that I wanted for queer folks. Um, and I didn't feel like I was a part of it, to be honest. Um, while while I, I don't identify as non-binary, I identify as a woman, I, I identify as queer first and foremost. And, and I think I share more similarity and sense of camaraderie with my queer community than I do with the women scientists community. So I posted this tweet in June of 2018, and it was just a, a self-declaration that I'm queer, I'm an arachnologist, and for the first time, I'm sharing both those parts of my identity in the same room at the same time. And I wanted to see what would happen. Um, I also started it with 50 other folks, um, 50 folks that I had found through email through writing colleagues and asking them if they would forward to anybody that they thought might wanna contribute their story. And the stories are simple. They're a, a photo, they're 250 words explaining why, what your identity is and why it matters to you. Um, and what, what's happened is that over the last three, almost four years, we've had over 1600 contributions to the campaign. These are people from all over the world. Uh, from every walk of life, from every scientific discipline you can imagine, from STEM supporting careers like science education, science policy. Um, we get we have a, a social community online of over 25,000 people that we try to connect. Um, we try to create a sense of community among. We try to promote the incredible contributions that they're making to science. And our website gets over 10,000 unique monthly visitors, um, even more in, in months like Pride, where there's, there's a lot of hubbub about trying to raise up uh, the visibility of queer folks. And, and so I think that the resounding question that I had in my mind of whether anybody else was feeling the same way and whether there was other folks out there that wanted to connect and wanted to make a queer STEM community is a resounding yes. Uh, and I think the evidence for that came really early on. This is, this is a tweet from just a month later, from July of 2018. Um, and, and it says, I hadn't met, let alone known of any LGBTQ STEM faculty until grad school and constantly even still questioned where my place in this field is or if it exists at all. And I'm thankful every day for 500 queer scientists, STEM for equality and 500 women scientists for showing me otherwise. And for me, that tweet was everything that I had thought. 
right? It was like as if somebody plucked these words out of my own brain and wrote them in uh, how many characters is a tweet now? 120, 120 character set statement. And and it made me feel for I, not the first time because for the preceding weeks before that we had cut found, we had had a 500 contributions to the visibility campaign, but it really reemphasized to me that that this work of creating visibility and finding each other in ways that we can't necessarily do in person is important and it's useful for the community to find its own voice. Um, and in the time since I've been working on other things as well, for example, uh, just uh, in June of last year, I launched a new exhibit. It's an exhibit that's free for anyone in the world to download and display in their own space, their own institution, their own hallways. Um, it's called New Science, and the tagline of it is queer and intersectional identities are revolutionizing how science gets done. Uh, and what it really focuses on is telling the stories of, of queer and trans women, uh, particularly women of color, who are working in the science sphere uh, and really celebrating their accomplishments because of not in spite of their identities. So all of the things that they're contributing to society that they're contributing to progress um, because of the unique identities that they have and that they hold and the way that they're changing um, what, what STEM looks like and who participates in STEM. And, and I'm really super proud of this uh, exhibit. We also have a, a virtual version through Google Arts and Culture. I'll find that link in, in just a minute and, and drop it into the chat if you wanna check it out um, because you can't come here on our public floor and see it in person. But as far as I know, it's the first ever exhibit uh, on a museum public floor that's focused on queer STEM uh, anything. So it, it's been pretty awesome. Um, and the, the, the thing I really wanna end with here is to say a little bit about allyship and, and what it means to, to be an ally. Um, obviously the work of making STEM equitable shouldn't fall to the people who are experiencing inequality. Uh, it's important to rely on allies and sometimes that means doing the work of, ex of building the allies up, right? Like reaching out and identifying people who are good allies. But what it means to be an ally is it's an active uh, 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 event, right? You, you can't be an ally by just sitting there on your hands. Um, you have to be actively engaged in the, in the process of allyship in order to actually be an ally. So I think my number one, Point of, rec like point of advice for allies is if you think back to what you've done recently to be an ally and you can't remember doing anything, then you're not being an ally. You have to be actively engaged in the process of allyship. And there's a few things that you can do that are super simple or things that you can direct uh, allies that in your life to. The first is that learn. And by learn, it means educating yourself, not treating queer folks as, as a walking encyclopedia. Um, there's tons of resources out there and those resources are, are easily available by, by just Googling, which I think we're all pretty proficient at at this point in time. Um, and again, I should mention that none of this is my ideas, right? Like these are ideas that I've gathered and collected from the community online um, that I thought were like really great and really amazing and actually like tractable things that you can tell people to do. I'm by no means an expert in allyship or queer rights or or how to behave or not behave, but I but I'm but I'm pretty good at listening and, and I and I try to, to pay attention when I think people are saying something really important. Uh, there's a few steps that, that I think you can also take. Um, first is to listen and just make space for historically excluded voices and amplify them importantly. I think the amplify is something that often gets forgotten. Um, oftentimes those voices are co-opted or or rebroadcast in a way that erases the, the origin of the voice. Um, and so amplifying those, normalizing the use of pronouns, it's super simple, like half the time we're all in virtual spaces these days. And so it's really easy to add your pronouns to your name. Um, and the reason that it's good to normalize the use of pronouns is that then, that then everybody gets used to just uh, make paying attention to the pronouns that people are using. Um, and, and, and what that means also is that sometimes you make mistakes. And so the thing to do there is to acknowledge but not make a big deal when you make a mistake. And that means like learning what you've done wrong, recognizing that it was wrong verbally, uh, 
learning from your mistake and just moving forward and moving on because moving forward and moving on is progress and 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 it's it's a way of being visible as an ally um the the last thing that i think is really important is to challenge discrimination and, and so this is something that i think is the most uncomfortable for folks um challenging discrimination is hard it means that you have to like do something you have to do an action that oftentimes is really uncomfortable and means creating an uncomfortable space for yourself as a way of taking that uncomfortable space off the shoulders of somebody else. Um, and there's a few things that you can do. You can intervene by asking the person that you're witnessing discriminate uh, to stop and explaining why it's not okay. I think more often than not, people don't realize that they're doing something that's not okay. Um, they've never learned, they've never taught themselves. Nobody's ever stopped them before because it's scary and intimidating. And so just intervening asking them to stop and telling them why it's not all right is, is the most straightforward way. Um, you can also just change the subject to stop the conversation if that feels too hard. Uh, there's, always, there's always power dynamics in every situation. And so sometimes it's easier to, to do something that's more passive um, as a way of, of not putting undue conflict into the situation, particularly for yourself. Um, and I, I would also just say that like anybody can challenge discrimination. To be an ally doesn't mean that you have to be like not the thing that you're being an ally for. And I think almost always, like no matter your personal, your personal circumstances, there's almost always somebody that has it worse than you. Like that's kind of life, right? Like there's always somebody that's has, that experiences greater discrimination, um, that experiences greater violence than you do on the basis of their identity. So you, another thing to do is just, if you can't think of something to stay in the moment that you're witnessing discrimination is just to do something later. You can, for example, raise the issue with somebody who has more authority to deal with it than you do, especially if that power dynamic comes into play or you're worried about the consequences for yourself as a, as a result of your personal identity. And I just wanna give you an example of like, for me, I think what's like the most amazing. And I, I, every time I ever talk about LGBTQ identities in STEM, I always end with this example because I think it's a really incredible and powerful example of what it means to be a good ally. And it's an example that was posted on Twitter like pretty soon after the launch of 500 Queer Sciences. And it was posted in response to somebody uh, having contributed their story and their boss or supervisor, or I think it was actually the dean of a department, um, saw the post on 500 Queer Scientists and sent this email in response to the person who had posted it. And I'm gonna read it out loud. Um, Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to let you know that I saw you were publicly identifying as non-binary and to assure you that you have my support. I also wanted to check in on whether there are any changes you would like me to make in the way that I or the team talks to you or refers to you, for example, name or pronouns or anything else that will help affirm your identity. Finally, please let please know you can come to me with any frustrations or concerns related to this or anything else. You're a great scientist and I'm proud to have you on the team. Regards, Nigel. And I don't know Nigel or Aaron, but I think that Nigel did like a really fantastic job of demonstrating allyship proactively by affirming the person's identity, asking them if there was anything that they needed to learn or change about what they were doing and assuring them that they had their support. Um, both in terms of supporting their identity, but also uh, acknowledging that they're there because they're a great scientist. And, and so I think that this, this is really a fantastic example that, that, that I personally aspire to, and I, I hope others will as well. And so I, I'm happy to take any questions, and I just want to end um, with this, that if you want to follow along with 500 Queer Scientists and our stories, um, you can find us on Twitter, on Instagram. You can contribute your own story at 500queerscientists.com or you can read the stories of 1600 incredible people in STEM all over the world. Thank you so much. I'm muted. Thank you so much, that was great. Um, so if folks have questions, um, feel free to jump in um, and speak up or you can put them in the chat and I will read them all. And don't be shy, you can ask me anything about anything. I'm like an open book. I will actually, I'll stop the recording at this point if that makes folks feel more comfortable.